Are you aware of a man named Hajime Tabata? If you've been paying attention to the ins and outs of Square Enix's recent AAA game library, you might have an idea. A man whose humble beginnings in the company eventually led him to having a couple of big breaks before landing a massive staple in the history of Final Fantasy. When it comes to the games that Tabata has directed, or as I have affectionately come to call him, Old Man Hands, they ride such a fine line with me between absolute heartfelt respect and oh no, stop, what are you doing? And Crisis Core, the prequel to Final Fantasy VII, is no different. There are choices made in this title that scream, Grandpa got into the gin cupboard again, whereas others are some of the best things he's ever done in his directorial career. Turning what could have been an absolute train wreck written by Kasushige Nojima into something which at times has a hearty emotional weight to it. And while something like Dirge of Cerberus, the last game created for the compilation of Final Fantasy VII, is a well-known guilty pleasure of mine, I feel Crisis Core is more of a solid game with a better overall foundation. Something I'd play for fun, rather than to satiate a vicious primal urge. And though some parts feel about as invasive as a fast-spreading fungus, there are some elements which work well and complement some of the characters in a way which Final Fantasy VII couldn't. And with the news that Tabata will be leaving Square Enix to forge his own company, let's take some time to celebrate some of his best and worst moments. Now before I jump into the game's introduction, I first need to make it clear that I'll be talking about this game as if you have some prior knowledge to the base premise of Final Fantasy VII. Same as my Dirge of Cerberus video. For those of you who may be confused, I'll lay down a very basic synopsis. This is Cloud. Cloud is a very confused young man who believes himself to be the highest rank of a Shinra-run military organization named Soldier. However, as the game progresses, it turns out that this may not necessarily be true. And for some reason, Cloud has adopted personality traits and memories of a mysterious dark-haired man. There's the antagonist, Sephiroth, a character who I'm sure you've heard about even if you've never touched this franchise before. A villain whose slow descent into madness captivated a generation, and who caused a 13-year-old Clemps to grow his hair out to the point of split ends whilst listening to the theme tune One Winged Angel on a continuous loop on his iPod shuffle. Those were the days. So why only cover those particular elements? Well, Crisis Core decides to give us a lot more insight into those two things. Really open our eyes to how and why these things are there, whether we want to know or not. Do you fly away now? To a world that abhors you and I? Shut up! All that awaits you- Shut up! So, with that out of the way, let's begin. Quick apology for the dips in quality at certain points. Even the upscaled game looks like it has some cutscenes which came straight out of 1999. Now, Crisis Core decides to give us something familiar to ease us into the setting, drawing parallels to Final Fantasy VII's opening with Cloud. Again, it's like poetry, it's sort of they rhyme. In a way, it feels almost like a passing of the torch. Or I guess passing the torch back due to the whole prequel thing, but you get my point. This is a pretty solid way of opening the game, honestly. Giving us something familiar to latch onto so it doesn't feel too foreign. And easing us into Zack's personality with the grace of a happy puppy falling down the stairs. Zack is a fairly hyperactive young man who at this point in the game is a second class member of Soldier. His mentor and friend, Angeal, a first class, is guiding him on this mission. We get into a scuffle with some Wutai troops disguised as Shinra soldiers, and don't worry, we'll get into the gameplay in just a little bit. Just gotta find a good time to slot it in. The joke will make sense in a few minutes. Just be patient. After a short encounter with the world's most easily distracted Behemoth, Zack is confronted by a mysterious enemy who forces him to surrender. This person turns out to be none other than Sephiroth. I know what that is! I actually find this particular segment really obnoxious. The opening itself is good. We're seeing a similarity between the opening of Final Fantasy VII and this game because of the similarities Cloud eventually shares with Zack. Like, I get it. It's poetry, so it rhymes. But then the game piles more on top of you, trying to fake you out whilst also being all, Do you remember this shit? Yes, who ordered the mama issues? Even Angeal is like, nah man, you're preempting your cue. You're, the, the script is missing a few pages. He isn't even seen as evil at this point. He's a hero of Shinra, but the game is winking at you like Anakin Skywalker's Darth Vader. Only gamers know. So it turns out that this version of Sephiroth was a hologram in a training exercise. Yet again, begging the question why he ended up there in the first place, other than a way to fake out the audience. Get a tech engineer on that shit, man. Zach could probably sue for less than that. And Giel's all, don't let your memes be dreams, and Zack is all, I beg your pudding, leading us comfortably out of a tutorial and into the main game. Now before we continue, a massive positive I have for this game is its soundtrack. 
To begin with, we're treated with a couple of remixes from the OG game, but all of the original compositions by Takeharu Ishimoto, who also created the stellar soundtrack for The World Ends With You, has created an OST where it's so distinctive, you can listen to it after years of never even remembering the game was a thing and go, oh, that's from Crisis Core. With many different renditions of a main theme playing throughout, and a lot of the tracks sounding almost like they came straight out of a backwater cowboy town. It gives the game this real strong sense of identity, giving the world this grungy western kind of feel, which really suits a lot of the environments these modern Final Fantasy VII games have, especially when you move away from parts covered in industry. Give me some violin and guitar and consider me sold. Almost immediately after this introduction, we're given our first proper mission by the head of soldier, known as Lazard. This mission is important for two reasons. Number one, it will give Zack a chance to be upgraded first, much to his delight. If he succeeds, he'll be joining the ranks of Angeal, Sephiroth, and the second important part of this mission, Genesis. This first class member of Soldier had gone missing during a mission in Wutai, and it's up to Angeal and Zack to track him down. Lazard asks Zack what his motivations are, and his response is to become a hero. Lazard commenting that unattainable dreams are the best kind. So right out of the gate, we're gifted, by the goddess, some might say, to one of the tinier inclusions to the Final Fantasy VII mythos that has me like, okay, why? These are the Benora White, otherwise known as dumb apples, due to their tendency to grow at random times in the year. This cunt melon ain't ripe. The conversation Angeal has about these dumb apples is another excuse for him to talk about his honour. And believe me, honour is something Angeal really likes talking about and he will not let you forget it. Apparently, stealing is fine unless the apples are growing in your mate's backyard. Then it's dishonourable. This translates to, I stand by my honour, so long as it falls into my definition of what honour means. My family earns less than minimum wage, making this Twix bar I stole an honourable motivator. Slap my butt and call me a nitpicker, but I swear this boy's code of honour is definitely questionable at certain points in this game, but whatever. You may also notice that Angeal's sword is very familiar. In Final Fantasy VII, we naturally all assumed that the Buster Sword's origin came exclusively from Zack, but Crisis Core changes this and gives us an origin story for the origin story. This is another change I'm not so hot on, because yet again, be it producer tampering or the writer and director being really big fans of Seven and wanting to write their own fan fictions, the Buster Buster Sword is an iconic part of Final Fantasy VII. It appears with Cloud in his promotional arts, it's on the title screen, it's familiar, and fans of the original game can spot that particular design from a mile away. In the end, the Buster Sword belonging to Angeal feels a little tacked on, because this icon of the franchise needs to be further explained. But does it really need it? I guess, for me, believing it was passed down exclusively by Zack held more weight than what this game attempted to replicate. Zack is asked to rush a Wutai base and clear it of enemies by doing what he does best, jumping in and causing havoc. He runs into a tiny reference ninja and eventually lets his guard down being clobbered by a boss. And Jill, at this point, has to step in and intervene. Now, before Zack dove into the Wutai base, he made the observation that he'd never seen Angeal use his sword, which had a lot of us scratching our heads, like, did he charm his way into becoming first class or what? But what I think this means is he only uses the back of his sword to attack his enemies. At least, that's what I've been told. Even if this is false information, it makes a lot more sense than giving Lazard a smooch on the cheek every day, waiting for that promotion. Here's where a major part of the story starts to unravel. Meet back with Lazard triggers a fight with three masked enemies, who spring a trap for Zack in the form of a summon spell. Sephiroth swoops in to save the day, and upon their victory, it appears that all of these mysterious assassins are clones of Genesis. And this proves that Genesis had teamed up with an ex-Shinra scientist known as Hollander. And in more worrying news, all contact with Angeal seems to have ceased as well. But wait, zoom and enhance. I think I recognize that face from somewhere else too. Yes, for those of you who know anything about the weird point in time when the compilation was being made, the Japanese pop sensation Gact was all too happy to lend his face and voice for the role of Genesis. He even let Square use two of his tracks in Dirge of Cerberus. And whilst for the longest time in my later teenage years, I denied enjoying his music because if it's popular, that means it's bad. 
I think I'm now old enough to not give a shit and can freely admit that Gact has made a few really great songs. That being said, if I was to play a hypothetical Final Fantasy spin-off where Robbie Williams was the main antagonist, I'd have a real tough time seeing him as anything but Robbie Williams in a game where everyone else from a design standpoint are completely made up from scratch. I understand that some people are able to suspend their disbelief for this kind of stuff, but as an individual, it just feels inherently silly seeing Sephiroth and an extremely well-known pop star standing side by side. I felt this with Jean Reno in Onimusha 3, so it's not like I'm picking on Crisis Core for this problem exclusively. A month passes at Shinra and still no word of Angeal, even from his family. We're assigned to visit the village where he grew up, alongside a member of the Turks we know from the original game named Song. Sephiroth was apparently going to come with us, but he declined due to being close friends with both Angeal and Genesis and this potentially clouding his judgement. Things automatically don't start off well in the village of Bonora, where it turns out that Genesis has already been there and has murdered Mummy and Daddy and slam dunked them in the front yard. Apparently this didn't scare off the supposed last remaining member of this village who turns out to be Angeal's mother. Left up against the wall is the Buster Sword, a symbol to this household at least of their family's honour. The implication being Angeal is leaving his honour behind. Now after this, Song decides to tell us the whole spiel that Sephiroth, Angeal and Genesis were all really close friends, and I'm sorry but I just don't buy it. This is something that Crisis Core does a lot I've noticed, the tell don't show kind of approach. The supposed friendship between Angeal, Genesis and Sephiroth feels so forced and shoved in there for conflict's sake without ever really showing us them as friends, and I won't hear anyone using the friendly duel as a decent example. That's no way to talk to a hero! Boy. Boys will be boys. Because using this as the only cutscene we get of the trio before the game's events is, dare I say, not leading me to believe these three hung out every weekend at the Dairy Queen. Show us Angeal bonding with Sephiroth. Show us Sephiroth first interacting with Genesis. Words are powerful, but in a story like this, backing them up with some kind of context would only serve as a benefit. And speaking of Genesis, oh lord, he coming. Now listen, I already feel bad because I had to get across the fact that I actually like this game despite its bullshit, but I've been dropping negative turds for the last few minutes and those stinky little nukes ain't gonna hold in place. Because my biggest overall problem with the compilation is here. The thing which, to my knowledge, has actually stopped a majority of the compilation from ever getting HD re-releases because either the people who own Gact as a brand won't let them, or the contract ran out and it's too expensive to renew. Genesis is god awful. Apart from his design, I think he's a complete wasted potential and he truly does feel like Gact had enough money to insert his own original character into one of his favourite game franchises. Like how much money and or personal favours do I need to offer old man hands before we can mute this fucker permanently? Is this Loveless or my old Bebo profile? I could sit a bunch of pretentious high school drama students down and play Genesis' appearances back to back and even they would roll their eyes and call this forced. This sure as hell doesn't spice up his languid motivations. Motivations which are spawned by his need to find something called the Gift of the Goddess. This, according to the script of the play he really enjoys, will cure him of his current unknown ailment, which is causing his body to degrade. Really, he couldn't come up with anything better? Maybe throw in some theatrics? Okay, maybe not that. What was originally a visually interesting part of Sephiroth's final boss form has now been retconned into being something genetic. Something which is meant to imply that the ones who have these are inherently monstrous. Bringing up what I said earlier about Sephiroth's one-winged angel theme, it was such a blinding success at being a recognisable tune in the video game industry. But they decided the best thing to do in Crisis Core was turn this design which was unique to Sephiroth and just copy and paste it onto virtually every first class member of Soldier. The the overall explanation for these wings being there in the first place boils down to it's just a side effect of the Genova project. Like, okay, I don't know why, considering Genova was the Final Fantasy VII equivalent of the thing, I just don't see how the connection between a shape-shifting alien monstrosity who could change her form to better suit her environment in order to trick civilizations, and one measly angel wing which for some reason is a genetic trait that people seem to gain when they're experimented on with Genova cells. For me, it kind of makes Sephiroth's final boss design less interesting, considering how it's now canon that a pop star beat him to it. Sorry mate, you're basic. 
Anyways, Genesis claims that Mummy and Daddy betrayed his trust and that's why he needed to kill them, losing his cool composure and deciding to cook Song a nice medium rare. He got better. We get defended by none other than Angeal, Genesis questioning if he's really sure about his decision, leaving without a word shortly after. After this, we get informed that the village needs to be neutralized in order to cover up the first class soldier's actions, which would reflect badly on Shinra. The village is about to get bombed, you say? Well, I must get there, post haste. <laughs> Now since I could find no better way to segue into the topic of gameplay without first demonstrating the extremely relaxed pace the game has to basic player movement, let's talk about the way the gameplay feels fairly similar. Don't get me wrong here, I actually do enjoy the game aspect of Crisis Core. It's the kind of thing I can admit won't appeal to everyone since it's fairly slow, clunky, and how can I forget? Activating combat mode. 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 But there's something to enjoy about its simplicity. When Zack gets into an encounter, he'll lock onto an enemy. If you select a basic attack, he'll automatically run up to said enemy and deal a blow. This can feel awkward, but eventually you get used to the janky PSP movements and can navigate an arena with ease. Sadly, stun locking regular enemies is far too common, which makes standing still and just mashing the X button a very regular occurrence. But this isn't always the case, and you'll be granted a bucket load of other skills which can be utilized. My personal favorite being Thunder, and it's very variations, which can cut through enemies making that one diagonal line you set up way too satisfying as you deal an extremely generous amount of damage. These extra skills come in the form of materia, orbs which are born from the life stream and can give the wielder magical powers so long as they have them equipped. And I only really stuck with the few I felt most comfortable with, ending up flipping thunder, cure and a regular attack until golden brown on both sides. I'm sure at this point I'm not really selling the gameplay that well, but I can tell you that my enjoyment of this game comes from the fact that I actually kind of like a slower paced action game at times, especially when I just want to wind down and relax. Back when my PSP still worked, I played this game for hours on end, going through the surprisingly massive missions menu which are all completely optional, but some can grant you access to extra accessory slots, materia, or in some cases even summon spells. Seeing that little percentage sign go up and up scratched an itch for me, and a game giving me things to do outside of a story are always welcome. So, on the topic of summon spells, how do they work in the gameplay? <laughs> well, I mean, boys and girls, are you a fan of slots? The joke will make sense in a few minutes. Just be patient. Mm, now we're getting into the really divisive stuff, for my own opinions as well. On one hand, I think this mechanic is one of the most pace-breaking, out-there things to insert into your action RPG, but on the flip side, I think it eventually leads to one of Tabada's most genius directing moves he's ever accomplished in his entire career, and leads me to believe that he is filled with talented, creative ideas, and we'll get to that in part two. But to make this as simple as I possibly can, there's a mandatory slot machine mechanic called the DMW, or Digital Mind Wave, something which apparently made its way into the game because my man Nomura and Yoshinori Kitase had a soft spot for Pachinko, and Tabada was like, yeah. Go on then. As Zack goes on in his adventure, he'll come across more allies. These allies are then added to the DMW, and if two of the same portrait match up on the left and right sides, you'll enter Modulating Phase. If you get the same character again, you'll initiate a limit break, which is unique to each character at the expense of 10 SP. And depending on the number it falls on underneath, will increase the power of the limit break and will level up the materia which is in the numbered slot. And hitting three lucky sevens will boost Zack a level. Again, I need to put emphasis on the word luck. Sometimes you'll see flashbacks of memories which never even occurred in the game, which admittedly is a pretty interesting way of giving us more character interactions, and I think this increases your chances of getting a limit break. Same thing applies to summon spells, it'll trigger randomly and then the same luck based rotation will determine whether or not it'll occur. My biggest issue with the DMW isn't that it's slot related, I mean Tifa had her limit break in Final Fantasy 7 and I loved that. My issue really comes down to the luck. 
suck. And the fact that you have no goddamn control over whether this thing triggers. It just happens. It, it just picks a time that suits it and not you. It's on a very tight schedule. It's gonna miss the flight. Now, as I said earlier, there is a redemption arc for this whole thing, and trust me, we'll get to it. In my opinion, it's well worth the wait. So, back with the story. Pee pee pee, poo poo poo, it's long and stinky and sticks to you. I mean, you gotta have a high IQ to understand Loveless. Fucking big brain over here. Zack makes it back to Angeal's mother's house and finds her dead on the floor. Angeal looming behind her. Zack naturally assumes the worst here and Angeal doesn't defend his actions. And I feel now is the point to finally bring Zack straight into the spotlight here. Because he's definitely my main reason for finding a lot of enjoyment in this game. The way Zack is handled is so good. My main reason for finding him such a joy is because he reacts the same way a lot of us would react if we were put into these situations. He questions everything that's happening, not in a Noe from Drakengard 2 kind of way, but in a way that an everyday human being would react if you were thrust into a world of military experiments and humans turning into monsters. Also, can I add how refreshing it is to see a Final Fantasy character in the compilation just flat out punch a dude or headbutt them for being a dick, instead of flying ten stories high like you're a kid playing with an action figure. Zack is likeable, his happy-go-lucky personality isn't grating, and watching him slowly break down as he's betrayed, and watches his loved ones get taken away from him is fairly fucking raw. At this point, even the game regrets Genesis so much, it destroys his village in a feeble attempt to cover him up. After Benora Village's destruction, we get into what I like to call the build-up to Sephiroth's inevitable betrayal arc. With Angeal and Genesis out of the picture for the moment, we get a nice chunk of time spent with Sephiroth, which is another part of a game I genuinely like. Whilst he's not the most compelling character before his gradual downfall, it's still really interesting seeing what he was like before the Genova experiment took over his life. Hell, seeing him worry about a friend in need kinda took me off guard. Like, oh yeah, Sephiroth was actually a decent human being at one point. Go figure. Just wish his friend gave him more to work with other than poetry and the <laughs> overwhelming power of smug. Now at this point, I'm gonna save us some time, because we'll be here till Final Fantasy VII Remake comes out if I summarise this at a snail's pace. Due to a majority of first classes going AWOL, Zack is upgraded to first. However, despite previously being so excited about the idea, he tells Lazard that it doesn't feel as good as he thought it would. Genesis clones attack the Shinra building, causing Zack and Sephiroth to act. After fending them off, we meet with a new canonical Turk member named Cisne. Her purpose in this game, other than to display her mannequin-ass swimsuit model, is to change Zack's mind about what it means to have wings. To Zack, it means you're a monster, but to Cisne, they represent freedom. Them. Kind of weird to think this wasn't Cisne's first appearance in a Final Fantasy spin-off. Also a shame that this particular spin-off is now banished of a void with no legal way to play it anymore. After our encounter with Cisne, we're teamed up with Sephiroth to find out whether rogue Shinra scientist Hollander is hiding out. As finding Hollander can give more answers as to why Genesis and Angeal betrayed them. Along the way, we come across this goofy ass who turns out to be an Angeal puppy, confirming that whatever is going on with Genesis and his clones probably links into why Angeal betrayed Shinra. Genre. Upon finding Hollander's secret lab, we get the flashback I brought up before where we finally see the grand motivation behind why Genesis is the way he is. He is jealous that Sephiroth gets to be the hero and not him. He has a hissy fit, injures his friend, heroically mind you, and gets his childish behind injured in a simulated fight. This injury never fully heals, leading the trio to get the assistance of Hollander. What happens after this, to Sephiroth, is a mystery. Project G gave birth to the man we know as Genesis. Project G. Project Genesis. Come on now. Abominations. Sephiroth. Right, so, Hollander announces to Sephiroth that he is the only person to stop the degradation process. This is the secondary motivation for Genesis and Friend. Essentially, and I'm going to explain this now because the game likes to piece its mysteries together in chunks which makes it a chore to summarise, but essentially, Hollander shares one similarity of Genesis in that he's a big jealous baby. Hollander's entire purpose, his entire existence within this game is to be a lesser version of Hojo, being jealous that he was never seen as a genius on par with him. So he pushes his research further and further into trying to create a human who shares the power of the first humanoids who lived on their planet, known as the Cetra. At this point, they're assuming that Genova is one of these. Oh, hold on a minute, who's this crazy character who steppied into the scene? Why, it's Dr. Klemps! What wacky ideas have you got up your sleeve this time? I can see how you got your PhD. 
In all seriousness, Hollander is another waste of a character. Final Fantasy VII had big dick Hojo, so Crisis Core is gonna create another crazy scientist to cause havoc, who just so happens to be utterly uninteresting and his connections to the other characters, again, make him feel even more similar to Hojo in a pretty embarrassing way, which we'll get to. Genesis drops in to shield Hollander from Sephiroth, but then gracefully lets Zack pass to apprehend him. Like, okay? Hollander escapes despite being a regular dumpy scientist and Zack being a first-class soldier like okay? Angeal steps out and to no one's surprise, they're using the one wing again. Angeal calls himself a monster. Zack calls him an angel due to Cisne's intervention. Angeal shits in his diaper and causes our dear good boy to plummet into Sector 7. Hello? Mom? Hello? What's with this game in the Oedipus Complex? Now, how can we have a prequel to Final Fantasy VII without expanding on one of the more well-known pieces of backstory we already know about Zack? His budding romance with series favourite, Aerith, found in a church which apparently shits out potential love interests for her to pursue. Their relationship is dealt with fairly well. It's not too overblown, with a little exception nearer to the end, but I can smell a fragment of chemistry there, which, let's be honest, is better than some game romances I've seen. Do something! But despite the romance and a few good moments, there's one part of a game that made me question why Zack even bothers. He is the one who motivates her to start selling flowers, and is also the one to offer up the idea of building a cart to sell them. It's then up to him to engage in a fetch quest to gather up all of the materials, and then when he builds the fucking thing, her response is... I want a nicer one. Fuck. You. The next big event is when Zack is sent, yet again, to track down a location where Genesis has been rumoured of visiting, alongside Song and a couple of infantrymen. The helicopter is downed, meaning they need to walk all the way there. But thankfully, Zack and one of the infantrymen are from backwater countryside towns, so they may know their way around better than the city-dwelling folk. In a strange move by Square Enix, they decided to let Cloud from Super Smash Bros. make a cameo, which I'd originally say is shocking, but they did let a pop star in, so I'm not overly surprised. Eventually, Zack finds Genesis, who's apparently really angry at Hollander for spilling a bag of flour over his head, and for failing to remedy the degradation process like he promised. Hollander predictably escapes, allowing Zack to duel with Genesis, leading to his victory. Genesis doesn't take this very well, and falls to his demise. After defeating Genesis, Zack hears news that Angeal has also made it to their location. Finding him in an abandoned bathhouse, and after flip-flopping consistently from rival to friend, he decides to stay and fight for some reason. Also, who ordered more Hollander scenes? Can you raise your hand so I can fucking smack you upside the head? <laughs> Hollander and Angeal have a bit of a history. Turns out this useless old man's want to be better than Hojo in every single way means he also had to impregnate someone who is implanted with Genova cells in order to create a specimen. The specimen being Angeal, and the woman being Jillian, who, as it turns out, killed herself out of shame for her involvement in the experiment. Genesis was a failure of this experiment due to having Jillian's cells mapped onto him during the fetal stage, something which has resulted in him degrading whilst Angeal remains perfect, instead giving him the ability to absorb genetic traits and pass them on to others. Hollander attempts to get a peck on the cheek from his wee baby boy, but gets promptly denied, allowing him to utilise his main character trait, which is to flee at the slightest whiff of danger. He gets captured, not that anyone cares. All of the monsters in the room, stunned at Hollander's boldness, all attempt to grab a cheeky kiss, but fail miserably and turn Angeal into a perfect disaster. Defeating Angeal gives us two things. We see how Zack claims the Buster Sword, and we also get to see Tabata flexing his director muscles and giving us an extremely satisfying scene. Something I hate in games especially is when a character screams the name of a recently deceased friend. I was fully predicting Zack to roll his head back and yell, Angeo, as the camera slowly pans up. But thankfully, we don't get that. He just embraces the sword and places it to his head, the same way Angeo did. It's quiet, and sometimes silence is better than words. We then see Aerith having a small monologue, but that isn't what's important. What's important is we get to see and hear Zack mourn. Aerith embraces the crying man, with no word spoken, and the game then transitions approximately two years after, where Zack is now training new recruits into the soldier program. 
And what happens next is the event which molded and shaped one of Square Enix's most well-known antagonists. And this is something we'll go into in part two. Thank you everyone for watching. As usual, I use the credits to drop a couple of updates and explanations, so I hope you stick around for a minute or two as words dribble out of my mouth. Firstly, if you enjoyed the video, please consider sharing it around to friends or wherever you think would enjoy it. And secondly is, of course, part two. Good news is, my well-loved patrons will only be paying for this video. They will not be charged for part two whatsoever. So if you're a patron or are thinking about becoming one, don't worry about being charged twice. And speaking of which, if you want to become a patron, the link to that is found down below. The highest tier is currently $5, which gives you early access to podcasts, and a single dollar can add you to the beautiful list of scrumptious delicacies which you can see scrolling down on the right. Any support is massively appreciated, and I can't say thank you enough. I also have a Twitch where you can watch me stream a whole bunch of goofy shit, and go follow me on Twitter if you want to see updates, or have a big anime butt pop up on your timeline because I have no self-control. Sorry. Thank you again for watching, and I'll see you all in part two.